Well, isn't God good this morning? Are you ready for the Word of God? I believe that you are this morning. Praise God. I believe that if we went home right now, we'd be blessed. But today what i like to do is continue our series that we've been doing entitled Epinosis. And what i like to do today is just simply pick up where I left off last week. And today's message is going to be entitled Ways People Get Stuck Part 2. Ways people get stuck past part two. In other words, ways that we sometimes get stuck in our faith and it just doesn't work. Amen. How many know that faith was designed to work? That faith was designed to work. Amen. But the truth is all of us have been a place in our life where for some reason our faith wasn't working. Amen. And uh, it's mainly because of wrong thinking or just simply not understanding or knowing how faith works. So this is what we're undermining and, and what we get rid of. Amen. And so this word epinosis, most of you know if you, because you've been coming. But in case that today this is the very first time, even though it may not be your first time here, it may be the first time that you've heard this word. What in the world is epinosis? Well, it's the Greek word for knowledge. Amen. But not just any kind of knowledge. This, this means God's knowledge or the true knowledge of God. And this knowledge is found in one place. And it's not a mystery. It's the Word of God. It's found in the Bible. Amen. Praise God. And so we found in this series, series why knowledge is so important. Because God works in our lives through knowledge. Amen. In other words, God works in our life through what we know and what we believe about Him. And there's two kinds of knowledge in particular that God works with in our lives to bring His blessings, His benefits, and His will to pass in His life. How many know He wants us benefited? How many know He wants us blessed? And how many know He wants His will to be known and worked in our life? And the good news is it can be because God has given us two kinds of knowledge that if we understand this and apply it to our life, then we will get God's blessing, His benefits, and His will in our life. And that first kind of knowledge is known as revelation knowledge because really that's what epinosis really is. Rep epinosis is the true knowledge of God, but it is really literally, um, it is a uh, it is revelation knowledge. And in other words, it, it, what it means is it's a spiritual understanding of God's Word. And the reason why that understanding is so important to our life is because the moment that we have understanding or with understanding of God's Word comes faith. That's why it's so important. This is why we must have revelation because revelation knowledge, amen, or reveal knowledge uh, tells us the truth about God. In other words, reveals to us who God is, what He's really like, and, and as important about our own self and what His will is for our lives. So with understanding of God's Word comes faith. And then the second kind of knowledge that we've looked at, the second kind is called applied knowledge. Amen. In other words, applied knowledge acts on the Word of God. It's what the Bible calls being a doer of the Word of God. I call it the missing link. Now listen, I called it the missing link because it's what we do with what we know that makes a difference in our life. It's not just what we know. It's what we do with what we know that makes the difference in our lives. Amen. And, and, and it's what faith is. Faith is really acting on the Word of God. So sometimes we think that just because we know something that it automatically is going to work for us. But no, it's what we do with what we know that makes the difference. So a lot of people know things about God, but it's what we do. What we do with what we know that changes everything is how we apply the Word to our life. It's being a doer of the Word and not hearer only is the missing link. Amen. It's acting on the Word of God. Now, let's do this for the fun of it today. You probably know these really well, but how many know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God? Repetition is the mode of learning. Amen. And it's not what you used to know. It's what we know. And it's what we're working in our life that makes a difference. So let's, let's talk about one moment. It won't take but a moment and remind us why faith in God is so important to our lives. Never let anyone discount faith. 
Never let anyone say, oh, you could talk too much about faith. Let's talk about some reasons why faith is so important. Remember, number one, and he, I'm just write these down real quick. They're not going to put them up. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, we can't even please God without faith. Okay, that's one reason why faith is so important. Another reason why faith is so important, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, and in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, faith is how we receive everything from God, including our salvation, including the baptism of the Holy Spirit, including forgiveness, including miracles. How we receive from God is by faith. Amen. Praise God. And then last of all, uh, the reason why faith is so important, according to James chapter 1, verses 22 uh, through 25, is that God's power is released in our life this way. In other words, God's power is released in our life through our faith working. This is why it's so important. Amen. So last week, we talked about ways that people get, there, get stuck in faith. And um, so many of you were here, probably all of you were here, or, well, I shouldn't say all of you were here. Maybe there's a few that's not. So let's, this really brief, I'm going to give you those two points, and then we're going to move on to two more today and close up for our service today. So uh, the first point that we talked about last week, that sometimes we get stuck in faith because we just think that if we had enough faith, our situation will automatically change. In other words, we just assume that if we, if we haven't received from God, it just must mean it's because we don't have enough faith. And that means that we have to continue to search for faith and, and try to get faith. Well, we should know how faith comes and how to get faith. It comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. But what we found is this. Um, it's what we do with what we know. That changes things. In other words, we can have faith, but we still have to use faith in order for it to work in our life. So a lot of times we get stuck in faith because something hasn't changed in our life. We automatically assume we don't have enough faith and we're, we're trying to search for faith. Well, when in, in reality, it's not maybe that we don't have faith as much as it is we haven't learned to use or exercise the faith we got. And until we exercise the faith we have or use the faith we have, amen, we're stuck. Amen, we're stuck. The second way we talked about being stuck is that sometimes we're waiting on God to do something in our lives when God is waiting on us to do something. In other words, I'm going to say it again, we're waiting on God to do something in our lives when in in reality, God is waiting on us to do something. In other words, to know how to believe and trust Him. We found this is a great example of this in Mark chapter 9 verse 23 when the the man had a a son who was uh, demon possessed. And they came and brought uh, uh, his son, he brought his son to his disciples and they couldn't cast him out. When they brought him to Jesus... Uh, Jesus, uh, 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 you know, he actually rebuked the unbelief and all that kind of stuff. But he asked the man some questions, and then the man just turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and heal my son. And Jesus looked at him and put it back on him. Remember, the man put it on him. said, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us and heal my son. But Jesus didn't have anything to do with that statement. Here's what Jesus said. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. So that's why I say sometimes we're waiting on God to do something for for us in our lives when God is waiting on us to do something. Amen. And God is always waiting on us for our faith, for for, for our belief. What we should know is what God has said, and that will bring faith and produce faith, and then God is waiting on us to believe and act on that word. Can I get an amen in here today? So what we want to do today is talk about two more ways that we can get stuck in our faith. Anybody ready for it? Now, the truth is, anybody can get stuck in faith. But the, the, the real reason why we need to talk about this is so that we know ways we can so we don't remain stuck. We can get unstuck. How many know if you run your car in the ditch, you want somebody to come around and pull you out? Not sit there and just talk about how you're stuck. Amen. You want to get pulled out of that ditch. Amen. And so anyone's faith can get stuck by simply not knowing the will of God. Now, this is so simple, but this is so important. Anyone's faith can get stuck by not knowing the will of God. 
So I'm going to make some important statements. I'm probably going to talk faster than, than you can write. Amen. But I'll endeavor to slow down a little bit because my wife will love it much better if I do, and you probably will too. Amen. Because I want you to get it. I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to get it. So let's talk about this. By not knowing the will of God, our faith will be stuck and can't work for us. This is why knowing the will of God is so important. Whenever you are unsure of the will of God, your faith is stuck. Now, you can do something, but your faith is stuck. Whenever you're unsure of the will of God, your faith is stuck. We must understand God's word. Now, here's what's important. You must understand that God's word and God's will are one and the same. You must understand that God's word and God's will are one and the same. So if we're stuck in perceiving what the will of God is, the answer is to get to the Word of God because the Word of God and the will of God are one and the same. See, God never designed the will of God to be a mystery to us. Amen. That's why His Word tells us that His Word is His revealed will. Amen. That's revelation knowledge. God, matter of fact, God's word being his revealed will to us is revelation knowledge. Amen. And so we have to understand that. Faith begins, therefore, where the will of God is known. Faith always begins in your and my life where the will of God is known. Faith begins, you can say it like this, where the word of God is known in our life. Amen. Praise God. God's word or promise to us is is always our foundation for faith. God's word or his promise is always our foundation for faith. Did you know that you cannot actually believe beyond actual knowledge? You cannot believe beyond actual knowledge. So a lot of times people think they can, but they're de they deceive themselves, they fool themselves. See, you cannot believe beyond actual knowledge knowledge. People think they can. Well, people say, well, I just believe God can do anything. You know what you just said? You said, really, you said nothing. That changes you. It, now, it may be true that God, that, that God is powerful, but God can do things, but that don't change anything in your life until you personalize it. Until you personalize it, it does nothing for you. It is not really a faith statement to say, I believe God can do anything. That is not a faith statement. And so it sounds like faith, but it's really not. And so God's word, because, you know why? Because it's not based on what you're saying is not based on any solid principle or, or promise in God's word to you. You're just probably just, just saying something that, you, that you've heard about God or believe about God. But in order for it to, to be personal in your life, you have to have a, a particular word or promise from God in order for the foundation uh, to be laid for faith in your life. That's why I say we cannot believe beyond actual knowledge. And so we can say it like this. It is impossible to boldly claim by faith a blessing that you're unsure God is offering you. See, you can't boldly claim a blessing that you're unsure that God is offering. This is why we must know what his word says because his word is his will. And once we have his word, we have faith for it. Hallelujah. And so without knowing God's will, it's only hope or wish, not faith. Did you hear what I'm saying in here today? Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm trying to really help us. Because the truth is, I, w I have been there myself. But without knowing God's will, it's only hope or wish and not faith. And here's the thing about hope. Hope has a place in our life. Hope is a good waiter, but faith is a taker. Faith receives from God what it knows it is God's will to give us. In other words, I'm going to say that again. Faith receives from God what it knows is God's will to give us. So you can't boldly claim a, by faith a promise that you are, sure, are not sure that God is offering. So in other words, if you're not sure that God wants you saved, then you can't, you won't, you can't boldly claim by faith that salvation could be yours. If you're not sure that healing, this is where people get stumped, stumped at. If you're not sure that healing 
can be yours, then it's no way you can boldly claim that by faith. You can wish for it. You can hope for it. But wishing and hoping is not the same of faith. And will not receive from God because hope is a waiter, but faith is a taker. Faith receives what it knows it is God's will to give us. Amen. Now, let's look at a story from the Word of God to drive that home to us. Because how many know that we may not be the only one that's ever got stuck there? Matter of fact, the truth is uh, none of us are the only one that's ever got stuck there. We've all been stuck there before. But I don't want to remain stuck. Just because I was stuck for, for a while, I don't want to remain stuck. How many know if you run your car, like I say, I'm going to say it again. I remember as a kid one time, uh, as a young teenager, somebody, somebody run me off the road. I was down in the ditch. At least they were, they were kind enough to turn around and pull me out. <laughs> but, you know, the point is I didn't want to remain stuck in the ditch. You know, some of the roads around here, it's hard enough just room for a, a good one car to go down. Amen. You meet another one. I mean, this person run me right off the road. I'm right down in the ditch. And at least they stopped to turn around and pull me out. The point is, I wouldn't want to remain there and just complain there and say, well, I don't know why I'm in the ditch. Well, I know why I'm in the ditch. They run me in the ditch. But the problem with us as believers, a lot of times when it comes to faith, we don't know why we're in the ditch. But I'm telling you, unless we know what the will of God is, we will remain in the ditch concerning our faith. Because faith begins where the will of God is known in our life. Look at this story in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And they came a leper to Jesus, beseeching him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you, if you will, or in other words, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be thou clean. Now notice here, Notice, it goes on, it says, and as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed, or he was healed. See, this man's problem was that he did not know what the will of God was. The leper was stuck because he was unsure of God's will in healing him. Notice he said, Lord, I know you can do this, but notice he wasn't healed because he knew God could do this. He had to know that God would do this. See, he was stuck in faith there because he was unsure what the will of God is. And I can tell you, we'll always be stuck in that faith until we know what the will of God is. But notice, Jesus once and for all settled what his will was. Now see, for him to say this, so who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is, you could say like this, the Word of God in action. Amen. It, you can say it like this, Jesus is the revealed will of God for all mankind. So whatever we see Jesus do is not just true for this man. Whatever we hear Jesus say is not just true for one person, it's true for humanity. Because Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say and I only do what I hear my father do. So if it was true, the, the, the point here, if it's true for this man, it's true for us as well. So notice Jesus said, Jesus moved with compassion, and he put forth his hand and touched him, and it said, I will, or I am willing, be, be thou clean. One translation says, um, of course I want to be healed. So you know what? When we ever wonder, you see, most people do not wonder if God can do something, and they think that's faith. But really, you can live and die with saying God can do anything. I'm going to say it again. You can live and die with saying God can do anything and not receive anything or God's uh, promises from him, just like this man did. This man said, God, I, hey, I know you can do it. But the question in my heart is, will you do it? See, he was stuck on not what God could do, but he was stuck, will God do it? And what did Jesus say? Of course I will. Of course I'm willing. Yes, I want to. Yeah. And that settled it, not only for this man, but it, what, it should settle for us, for all mankind. And so, so it's not enough. In other words, you could say it like this. Uh, it's not faith to believe that God can do so something. Faith is produced by knowing what it is will for him to do. So once he found out it was his will for him to be healed, he could receive his healing. But he had to know that it's God's will to heal him. 
You know, the tr- same is true for us. We got to be convinced that it's God's will to heal us before we will be. I said, I'm going to say it again. We have to be convinced that it's God's will to heal us. See, we're going to have to get some tradition out of our mind. We're going to have to get some wrong teaching out of our mind. We're going to have to get anything out of our mind other than what Jesus said in order for us to receive it. See, I want you to receive from God more than I want you to like me. This is why I'm telling you the truth. I'm not hiding behind this pulpit and trying to make you feel good about yourself today. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself today either. But what I am trying to do is try to rattle all of our religious thinking or rattle our, our minds to think the way God thinks about things because until we do, we simply will not receive from God. It's knowing that healing is His will for you and believing and acting on that that heals us. The power of this story illustrates is God's will to heal and and more importantly, is God's will to heal all. Well, Pastor Chris, I think there's some... I think there's some... um, um, what, what, uh, exceptions to that rule, Pastor Chris. Oh, really? Then tell me scripture and verse for it. Because Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Not a few, not some, not if you're good enough, not if you, you got into the bed on the right side, not if you grew up and you're a certain color or you're a certain culture. Oh, all oh! that was oppressed of the devil. That's God's will. But we got to believe that. We got to know it and believe it. Until we know what God's will is concerning something, our faith is only hope and it's stuck. Now, see, you wouldn't say that about healing. I mean, you, would, you might say that about healing, but you wouldn't say that about salvation. You know what? You fight to get people saved and to talk people in that it's God's will for them to be saved. Why don't we do that about healing? You know why? Because we've been b- religiously brainwashed and still a New Testament taught. In other words, we've been, we, we think that it works a different way for something like this because, you know what, um, I have this example in my life, and you know, I think if God really wanted me healed, I'd be healed. When does our own human reason and thinking equate in for to be a voice in what God has said? No, we got to go to God's Word and say this. Listen, we've all missed it, but the point is that if you treated salvation that way, then you'd never be saved. You have to know that it's God's will to save you. In order for you to be, to receive salvation. And so, you fight for people, amen, to get them to believe that God will forgive them, that God will save them. Because you're so convinced of that. You know why? Because you heard the word and your faith is in the word. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoso will believe on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God will take our sins and throw them behind our back, never to remember them anymore. He'll forgive us from our, our sins and put them as far as the east is from the west. Come on, God will do all those things for us. We're so convinced that salvation belongs not only to us, but to the world. That's why we go and tell them. And we keep after them until they have faith to, to hear it and, re, and, and, and just simply receive it. If they say anything else, they say, no, 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 no. God loves you this much. Why don't we do that with the rest of the will of God? And when we do, then people will receive from God. Amen. So it is important that we must know what the will of God is in our life because anyone's faith can get stuck by not knowing the will of God. You ready for the second and last one today? The, the second way today that we're going to talk about that people get stuck in faith is called sense knowledge, faith. Sense knowledge, faith. Now, if you've been with us for this whole series, months ago, back in probably in, in January, one of the, the one of the see, there's seven kinds of knowledge that the Bible teaches us. Two, or, or let's say it like this: five out of the seven are less than the knowledge of God. In other words, they will not produce God's results in our life. 
One of those kinds was sense knowledge. We're going to call it today sense knowledge. Sometimes it's called sense knowledge faith. But at, we get stuck in faith by living in by our senses. In other words, it's called sense knowledge because it's knowledge we gain through our five senses. In other words, it's knowledge we gain through what we, what we see, hear, touch, feel, taste, and smell. It's natural knowledge. It's not bad or wrong. It's just we don't receive from God with or through this kind of knowledge. You don't receive from God from this, with this kind of knowledge. It's not bad or it's not wrong. It's knowledge we gain from the world around us, from, from our, our five senses. Amen. It's the, the problem that we have is with this. It's not the kind of knowledge that God works through. We receive sense knowledge from the world we live in by what's around us. It can produce natural faith, but not spiritual faith or faith in God. See, I look and see there's a chair there. I see, I see Cheyenne sitting in that chair, so I have a belief or a faith that if I went and sit in a chair next to her, that chair would hold me. It's natural faith. You have faith. You didn't even think about it. You have faith that that chair was created to hold you. You just walked in and sit down on it today. It's natural faith. It goes by. Now, if you walked in and you saw that two out of the four legs were off of it, you examined it, you probably would not have faith to sit down in it because of something you saw. See, that's natural faith. It's nothing the matter with that. I said, it's nothing the matter with that. But it's just not spiritual faith or faith in God. But listen. Sense knowledge faith obviously has a place in our lives because if you're cooking on the stove, it does no good to say, that stove ain't hot, that stove ain't hot, that stove ain't hot, and go pick up the pan and with bare hands. Guess what? You're going to get burnt. So as five senses has a place in our, in our life, has a, has, a, has a place just like common sense does in our life. But it is never to replace or to be confused as faith in God. In other words, what we feel, what we see, what we touch, taste, smell, should never replace our knowledge of God, supersede it, or be confused as faith in God. Problems occur in our lives when we as believers make sense knowledge superior and our belief to our knowledge of God's Word. I'll say that again. Problems occur in believers' life. Thank you for saying that. Problems occur in believers' lives when we make sense knowledge, what we see, hear, feel, superior in our belief to our knowledge of God's Word. In other words, it's when we allow what we see or feel to determine what we believe instead of God's Word. That's going by sense knowledge. It's when we allow what we see or feel to determine what we believe instead of what God's Word says. That sense knowledge faith. And it is an enemy to real faith, and it will cause us to be stuck in faith. Cause that faith to be stuck. Our real faith will be stuck as long as we walk by sense knowledge faith. Now remember, sense knowledge has a place. But sense knowledge faith is an enemy to real faith in God. It's an enemy. To real faith in God. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Didn't say we walk by what we feel. Notice it didn't say we walk by what we believe. I mean, it, did, I, it didn't say, I'm sorry, rather, it didn't say we walk by what we see or by what we feel. It says we walk to walk by faith, by something we believe. Amen. We're called to walk. Or to live by faith, not by sight. Not by what we see or feel. What does it mean to walk by faith? It means to live by what the Word says. To receive by what the Word says. To believe by what the Word says. That's what it means to walk by faith. And notice it says, not by sight or not by how you feel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, or verse 18 rather, says that while we look not at the things that are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal or subject to change, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. Hallelujah. 
And so even though, in other words, when it comes to faith in God, you cannot be moved or live just in this natural realm. You cannot be moved by just what your eyes see or your ears hear. Amen. If what your eyes see or ear hears is contrary to the word of God, God is saying walk by faith. Now, once again, if what I, I see and ears hear, you go into the parking lot today and your wife said, stop, honey, a car's coming, and you just pull on out. Say, I'm going by faith. They ain't not going to be there. I mean, know that we all going to go to an accident scene, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. It's when what, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about throwing out common sense. I'm not saying that your five senses does not have a place in our life. But when your five senses contradict or try to dominate our belief over the Word of God, that's when it becomes a problem. In other words, when what God tells us no longer becomes superior to what we feel Or what we see in these natural eyes, what our mind is telling us, then we're in trouble. Amen. When what we see, feel, or hear contradicts what God has told us, we must learn to trust and believe what God has said over those things. That's faith. That's walking by faith. Faith in what God has said in His Word. Sense knowledge, faith is less than faith in God. Amen. And can never receive God's blessings. That's why we must be warned about it. Sense knowledge believes it's five senses over what God has told us in his word. And therefore, that gets us in trouble. It it doesn't please God, and it doesn't receive God, and we get stuck. Why ain't our faith working? Ah, that faith stuff don't work. Pastor's talking about this. And that don't, it don't work that way. I wish he'd talk about something else. I wish. Now, nobody in here would do that. But all for those, the thousands are listening online, they might be c- connecting right now. So let's just let's be patient with them, okay? Yeah. Amen. No, we've all been there. We've all been there. When our, when our body is telling us one thing and God's Word told us something else, when the pain is shouting louder than the Word, we've all been there. Who's been there when you wake up in the middle of the night with a pain that don't belong there? We say don't belong there. When you become born again and you get saved and you understand the promises of God, you understand you've got authority over some, some things. And when pains and aches and pains, you don't just embrace them like a, a pet kitty cat, let them crumb up in the bed with you and pet you and go to sleep with you. Call it my this and my that and my this and my that and my arthritis and my heart. This and I, no. Come on. We've all been there. I'm not, listen, I'm trying to help us. My God, I'm trying to help us. We got to, if God's word says something, whatever God's word says about us, we are to say that about us. And we, we say, well, I can't help it, Pastor Chris. I feel that way. I know I felt that way too. But feeling and real, feeling real is two different things. God's Word is real. Yeah. You say, well, that yeah, pain is real too. I understand that pain is real. But that, I got something that can get rid of the pain. It ain't a Tylenol or, 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 or a shot of morphine. It's the Word of God in the name of Jesus. I'm, listen, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against medication. I'm not against any of that. But I'm telling you, God is, God is giving us something that's free. Listen, it cost Him the life of His Son. Hey, He hung on the cross, took those stripes on His back, and bled and died and went to hell for you and I. It might not cost us anything except to believe. It cost him everything, his life. How dare us to say, well, you know, uh, I, I know that sounds real good. The pastor's, what the pastor, no, it sounds good because God is trying to get his attention. That's what the word says. 
And if we go by the, what the Word says instead of what we feel, then we'll get God's results. If we don't, we get in trouble with God. We don't please God. We don't receive from God. We get stuck. We get murmuring and complaining. We go around the wilderness for 40 years. And, oh, and we die in the wilderness. And, and everybody goes to your funeral and say, well, you know, it was the will of God for them. to. You know, they, they were a real trooper. They and all. Oh, yeah. And listen, please, I'm not despair. I'm not, I'm really not, I'm not speaking disparagingly about, about anyone or anything. Because those things do happen in our lives. But let's get our thinking straight. Let's think, because we never get, we never get changed if we don't think in line with God's word. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. How about, how about this story? I'll give you a couple real quick. Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Anybody remember what Numbers 13 about? About when, they, when Moses sent out the 12 spies in the wilderness. Yeah. Amen. And, and sent them out into the promised land, to view at the promised land. Okay? And so here's, here's a good story. Amen. Let's turn there to Numbers 13, and we're going to read a portion of Scripture. Numbers 13. What are we talking about, Pastor Chris? I don't know. You get, oh, and we're talking about sense, knowledge, faith, and getting stuck that way. That's what we're talking about. Is everybody all right in here today? Yeah. Numbers 13, verse 26 says this. And they went out and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation. So Moses sent them out, and here they're coming back with the report. In other words, here's what God said. Here's what God said. I'm giving you the promised land. Go spy it out and see that it's a land of milk and honey. Look at it and know you're going to possess it. Here's what they said when they came back. And they, and they went and came to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of Israel, until the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back a word unto them and to all the congregation. And showed them the fruit of the land. And told them and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it flowed with milk and honey, just like you said. And this is the fruit thereof. Nevertheless, 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 but, 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 the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and, a great, and very great. And more of all, we saw, we saw, we saw. The children of Enoch there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the southern, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and all the termites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of the Jordan. And Caleb still the people. Oh, would to God. How many Caleb's we got in here today? Would to God. We got some Caleb. Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to possess it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up at this time against the people. For they are stronger than we are. Didn't you see them? We're five foot two and they're eight foot three. And they brought up an evil report. Here it is. They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched into the children of Israel, saying the land, though which we have searched it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. God didn't say that. They say, it's the land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. We go in there and all of a sudden we're gone. And all the people that we saw in it, they're men of great statue. And there we saw, we saw, we saw, we saw, we saw. The giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. How did they know they were in their sight? They, know, they didn't even know they were there. See, doubt and unbelief goes from one degree to pity to another degree. And you know what? Here, you know what happened to that, that, whole, that whole generation? You know where they died? In the wilderness. They never entered to the promised land. You know, the only two that entered to the promised land was the ones that spoke up. Joshua and Caleb that stood up and said, God, we are well able to do what you said. This is this land you gave us. See, this, bring this into modern day. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw what, what I saw that x-ray. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw. That report, that report, that report, that report. And we're just not well able, Lord, to do this. This is, this is a death sentence. There's nothing we, we can do. When God has said, by his stripes, we're healed. This, this is your promised land. This is All that God is waiting. He's not, he's not saying to deny this. He's just saying deny the right to operate in you. 
He's not saying deny it, say it don't exist. He's saying, oh, I got a different report. In my report, the report of the Lord is about to change that because my inheritance, God said, already belongs to me. All I got to do is possess my land. And so, but here's where the key is. It's what we do with what we know that makes a difference. And it might mean some nights that we sit up and say, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, cancer, you're not going to live in my body. In the name of Jesus, I call you rebuked. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I command you to die. I say, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Brain, I'm talking to you right now. I call you healed in the name of Jesus. I call you rebuked, every pain, every infirmity. I command you to leave. Devil, I cut you off at the root in my life, and I forbid you to operate in me. And I say, by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes I'm healed by Jesus stripes I'm healed if let me tell you something if you ain't willing to do that then you ain't in faith because the Bible tells us that's what we have to do that's what faith does the woman with the issue of blood for she said or actually it, it, it said she kept saying if I may touch his clothes I shall be made whole you ain't going nowhere anyway why not stay up and just speak to it? Drive it out. It ain't changing by laying in the bed crying about it. I'm helping us. This is real. This is not fairy tale. This is where we live at, church. When de devils of, oh, let's, let's go home on this one. When devils of, of oppression and depression come against your mind and now you think you're crazy. You feel weighted down and, and, and depressed and, and rejected and, and hopeless and in despair. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. And it just gets worse because you do nothing to, as a believer to resist that. Then all it does, one lie feeds onto another. And the devils are, are being poured out to, to torment you. And it goes from oppression to depression. And it just gets worse. When are we going to rise up and say... That God says something else is different about this as a child of God. This may be happening to me. This may be happening to me. And I feel rejected. I feel all those things. But there is a promised land that God has given me. He said, I've given you a promised land. Matter of fact, he told us to go check it out too. You know how we check it out? We don't get in our car and drive to Gloucester to see it. Here's what we do. We start reading about the promises of God in, our word, in the Word. And then we begin to confess what the Word says. No, devil. Now, right now, I rise up and I bind you. You don't even feel like it right then. You don't feel like it right then. But you have to rise up and put the Word of God in your heart and in your mouth. And then begin to release it in faith. And say, devil, I bind you in Jesus' name. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I rebuke depression. I rebuke that fear that's coming against me right now in Jesus' name. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. I submit myself to God. I resist you and you flee according to the word of God. And then begin to sing songs and, and praise unto God. As God in heaven begins to release angels and the anointing of God that destroys the yoke. And God in heaven is singing songs of deliverance over you. And bring freedom unto your household. But that's how it works, church. I think that's how it works. It don't work by, by your, it don't work by a silly mind. Or a, a few silly comments from a few silly friends. If they ain't telling you this, then find somebody that's going to tell you this. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, just a couple of quick examples. I can do this quick. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Let's do this really quick. Matthew chapter 14. You know the story that Peter walked on water. In verse, he did walk on water. But verse 30 and 31, it says, but when he saw, everybody say saw. saw. 
saw, 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 saw. The wind and was afraid. Everybody say afraid. Afraid, 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 afraid. What we see affects our heart. He saw the wind boisterous. God, there's a hurricane out here. And, and we, God, what do you think I'm supposed to? What? Not even you're able to help me in this. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, said unto him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. The point is, he did walk on the, the, he did walk on the water. He did something all the other disciples didn't do until he saw. Until he saw with his five senses. And that became to dictate his faith. And when our five senses dictate or replace our faith in God, then we sink just like he sinks. And the truth is we've all sunk before. But you know what? The good news is I got encouragement for you today. Jesus picked you up just like he picked me up. And he got back in the boat and he said, let's try this again. And we go to another day. And the point is we had another day. And we had a day that God is saying we're not to walk by how we feel, by what we see, or just by what we hear, by our five senses. We're to walk by what his word says, by what we believe. And the sooner we, 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 we get that, the butter off we are. What about, what about what well, we call do doubting Thomas? Oh, Jesus appeared to all the disciples except Thomas. Thomas, what did he say? Oh, I'm not going to believe. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This Jesus stuff, I saw him when he was alive, but I saw him die. Are you kidding me? I saw them crucify him. I saw them put nails in him. I saw them beat him. I saw him die. They put the spear in his side. I saw the blood. I know he's dead. I saw him put him in the tomb. They said, he's alive. We saw him. He said, I'll not believe unless I can put my hand in his, in, in his hand, put my, thrust my fist in his side. What did Jesus do? Jesus walked and 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 and. And guess what he, he did when he saw him? My Lord and my God. Oh, I worship you. And J Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are they who have not seen, yet believe. Amen. Listen, and I can tell you, every person that's ever believed on him had to come that way. Every person that's ever come to Jesus has to come that way. You had to be convinced that he is. And that he is a rewarder. They exist. That he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen. Now, I'm going to close with this, this final illustration. And let us know that there's hope for us all. That is an amen. Because where you are or where you were is not where you have to be. And there should be, as Paul told the church of Thessalo the Thessalonian church, there should be an ever-increasing faith in our life. So we never arrive. We just continue to grow. This is why we talk about these things. Mark chapter, I'm closing. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Come on, Brother Ryan. Afterward, Jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them, or he rebuked them with their, um, for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they believed not on them which had seen him after he was arisen. So we always read this about Thomas not believing, but the truth is all of them didn't believe until they saw him either. And what was the first Je thing that Jesus did? Here's, here's what people think he did in religion. Oh, I know exactly how you feel. Uh -huh. You saw all that stuff. And you know what? I can understand why you didn't believe when they came and told you that I was alive. I understand. You saw me die. You saw all those things. I can imagine how you feel. And I know there's a reason why you just wouldn't believe. No, he didn't say any of that. That's what we think he said. That's how we act. He didn't try to have sympathy for them. He didn't even try to be empathetic. Imagine that with them. Come on, he didn't. He just upbraided them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. You know why he had to? To set an example for us today to let us know that unbelief and hardness of heart is something that keeps us from ever receiving from God or faith to even work. Going by what we see or feel 
is not how we know God. Going by what His Word says and what we believe in His Word is what we're to be dominated by and be led by. It's important that we know this because too many times in the church world, we get stuck in faith and say that faith don't work. But it's not because faith don't work. It's because we don't understand how to work it. Or we have identified an enemy of real faith, which is sense, knowledge, faith. Sense, knowledge is not faith in God at all and therefore cannot help us to receive from God. We gain knowledge of this world through our five senses, but we gain knowledge of God, epignosis, only one way. And that's through God's Word. We must remember knowledge is important because God works through knowledge, but He works through the right kind of knowledge. His knowledge, epinosis, what we know and believe about Him. And it's what we do with what we know that makes the difference in our lives because that alone can receive from God. So what do you know about God today? Where are you stuck at? Maybe you're not. Hopefully you're not. And if you're not, then hopefully you've paid close enough attention so that you're able to take these points and be ready for people that you're going to help to get unstuck. Because the truth is, in Life Church, as we live for Jesus and we go into all the world and preach the gospel, there's going to be people at various places in life, and they're going to be stuck. And it's our job to be the Holy Ghost record truck to help get them out. But you know what? The truth is, we can't if we don't know how. We can if we, if we sit here and say, that was a really nice message, but two weeks from now, we don't, we, we don't even remember one point or, or, any, or anything that stuck with us to be able to help someone else. Or we depend upon the pastor, think that the pastor is going to be kind of like, you know, like the Holy Ghost can be everywhere at one time and do everything for everybody. Can't do that either. You know why? Because he's called all of us, each of us, to be someone else's answer. To be Jesus, so to speak, manifest in their life. I know you're not Jesus and I'm not Jesus, but what his representative, his ambassador, his representative. To bring the word of truth to them so they can be helped and not hurt. Just like we were helped. But what about you in here today? Where you're at, are you stuck in any place? Hopefully, what you've heard in these messages has helped get you out. But always remember this. The first thing is what we know. But what we know alone doesn't change everything. Makes us feel better. We got an answer. But it's what we do with what we know. So keep doing what you know. 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 It's what we do with what we know that makes a difference. Amen. Where are you at in your life today? Where do you feel stuck? Maybe you don't. Hopefully you don't. But you know what? One place that all of us have something in common here today is this. If you're a believer... And if you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, one thing that we all have in common, that if you have the heart, the love of God in you, you want this. You want others to be saved and right with God. Amen. I hear the amens through here. That's just a good place to say amen, Pastor. So all over this place today, as we prepare to leave, well, I'm going to give this invitation to those that may not know Him.